Did I skip? That was a little excerpt from a recently released movie, The Red, a horror story featuring a decidedly unfriendly outsized killer kangaroo with a nasty habit of ripping people's heads off. It's my professional opinion that no such beast lurks in the Australian bush today. Although, don't get me wrong, a big buck kangaroo is not an animal you should mess with. These guys are pumped and potentially dangerous. But what if I told you there was a time when kangaroos really were killers? These were the killer giant rat kangaroos. And if you'd like to find out more about these ravenous roos, keep watching. Hi, I'm Professor Steve Rowe. I'm a real paleontologist, and you're watching Real Paleontology. And today, we're talking killer kangaroos. A whole extinct subfamily, in fact. The subfamily is called the Propleopinae. It's a group that's close to my heart. I began my scientific career studying these guys way back in the early 1990s and published my first ever peer-reviewed scientific article on the oldest species known, this critter here, a Coltadita ima, which was discovered in Riversley, northwestern Queensland, in deposits around 20 million years old. I'm going to have more to say about a Coltadita, but first things first. What even is a Propleopan kangaroo, and how many were there? Well, there are at least six recognised species that fall in three genera. A Coltadita, with two species, Propleopus, with three, and Jack Mahonii, with just one here. Their closest living relative is this tiny guy, the musky rat kangaroo, Hypsiprimnodon muschatus. It's a cute and curious little rainforest creature, the smallest of all living kangaroo species, weighing in at around 500 grams or 18 ounces. And it further stands out in that it's the only member of the kangaroo clan that can't hop. It uses more of a rabbit-like bounding motion. But its extinct cousins, the Propleopines, weren't quite so cuddly. The largest species, Propleopus wellingtonensis, ranged from about 35 kilos or 77 pounds to 70 kilos or 154 pounds in weight. Propleopus species have been found quite broadly over most of Australia in Pleistocene deposits from around 5 million years in age. However, they are not a common find anywhere. They are known mostly from teeth and lower jaw material. The most complete specimen of Propleopus is this very partial skull described by David Wright here back in 1997. And we know practically nothing about the postcranial skeleton of this genus. All we have is this upper arm bone. The smaller species was a Coltadita ima here, which would have weighed in at around 5 to 10 kilo or 11 to 22 pounds. A Coltadita species are known only from Oligomyosine deposits in the wonderfully fossil rich. Riversley World Heritage Area of northwestern Queensland. These range between around 25 million and 10 million years in age. However, we have far more complete material for this species, which includes two near complete skulls. This species was named by my PhD supervisor, Professor Michael Archer, back in 1982, based mostly on some lower jaw material. Mike has been overseeing the Riversley project for decades and it's yielded an absolute treasure trove of vertebrate fossil material. Anyway, myself and some colleagues published a description of the first Occultadita skull back in 1997. Here's me back in the day with that skull and a lot more here than I have now. I'm going to concentrate on this species here, partly because I have a soft spot for it, but mostly because we obviously have more data for it too. In fact, with the second skull, we now have everything we need to reconstruct the first complete cranium and lower jaw for a Propleopine kangaroo, and you get to see it here first. This was put together by my friend, colleague and once PhD student, Dr. Rex Mitchell. Rex has his own YouTube channel these days called The Scullywags Lab. If you're interested in skulls and who isn't, you should check it out. So. Why do we think these propleopine kangaroos may have included significant amounts of meat in their diets? 
everyone knows that kangaroos are strict herbivores, right? Well, for sure, that's pretty much true for all the larger, better known species like the big red or big grey kangaroos. Although, as you can see, even these guys won't turn down an easy meat meal if the opportunity arises. But many of the smaller, so-called rat kangaroo species are rather less fussy. And this definitely includes the Propliopine's closest living relative, the musky rat kangaroo, which includes a lot of invertebrates like insects and worms, along with fruits, nuts, seeds and fungi. Newsflash, just quickly as a little aside, literally a few minutes ago I received an alert on my newsfeed alluding to a scientific article published just today. In this paper here by Peter Bishop and friends, the authors confirm that the musky rat kangaroo doesn't hop even at maximum speeds. It exclusively uses what is called an asymmetric gait. This is implications for our understanding of how hopping evolved in kangaroos. I might discuss this further in a later video. Okay, back to our killaroos and what has convinced many researchers that they included meat in their diets. Well, first and foremost, it's about the teeth. Perhaps unsurprisingly, tooth morphology is highly informative when it comes to predicting diet. And this is especially so for mammals, which commonly have very different teeth in their jaws adapted for very different tasks. I covered this in an earlier episode on the giant short-faced bear. But basically in Propliopine kangaroos, like bears and a number of other living omnivores, we have two kinds of cheek teeth. High-crowned vertical shearing blades, which are great for slicing through material like meat, and low-crowned bunodont teeth that are used for crushing foods. These bunodont teeth are more of a general purpose tool used to pre-process a wide range of foods such as fruit, nuts and tubers. They're not very useful for processing grass or leaves. Now in simple terms we can get a very good idea of the relative importance of meat as opposed to plant material in an animal's diet by measuring the length and height of the vertical shearing teeth and comparing these to the surface area presented by the crushing teeth behind it. It's important to note here that it's not just the length of the blade, but its height or depth that matters. A thin blade is less effective for processing meat than a deep blade. This is what we call high amplitude shearing. In an extreme hypercarnivore like a cat or marsupial lion here, the deep vertical shearing blade totally dominates the cheek tooth row. There is little or no crushing element in the dentition and crushing teeth are either greatly reduced or lost altogether. On the opposite end of the spectrum we have dedicated herbivores like the big grazing kangaroo here. In big kangaroos you may find a relatively long vertical shearing blade but it is always very low crowned. This can be useful for biting through twigs but pretty much useless for slicing and dicing a serious meat meal. There are also big differences in the molar teeth behind it compared to the molars of a coltadita here. Bottom line is that if you compare the cheek teeth of a propliopine kangaroo to those of other mammals, the vertical slicing third premolar is pretty damn big and high crowned, and the crushing molars behind it are pretty darn small. The ratios between the length and height of the slicing blade relative to the area available for crushing are broadly comparable to those of an omnivorous fox or bear. Now among our propliopines this ratio varies. In a coltadita the slicing premolar is relatively larger than in its bigger more recent cousins with one exception Propliopus shiligoensis here. Its third premolar is ginormous. Unfortunately we only have the teeth of this species and no skull. There is however another line of evidence based on tooth data that we can look to for assessing diet here. In his 1997 paper David Ride studied tooth wear patterns in Propliopus and concluded that they were consistent with a diet that included meat. Now like I said teeth are the first thing we look at when we're trying to determine diet but the anatomy of the skull is also important. Of course we only have one species that we can look at here, a Coltadita ima. What's it telling us? Well, a common feature of many carnivorous mammals is a powerful bite. 
Now, I haven't done the actual numbers yet, but one thing is obvious, even from a cursory examination of a Coltadita's skull, it had bloody powerful jaws. You can tell it had big jaw closing muscles because this area here, bounded by the cheekbones, is very large. And this means that the jaw muscles that pass through it must have been big too. And the cheekbones themselves are massive. A Coltadita also has a surprisingly well developed sagittal crest for the attachment of jaw closing muscles. Of course, considered by itself, powerful jaws certainly don't prove that an animal is a carnivore. But when you put it all together, tooth morphology, tooth wear, skull anatomy, and the fact that its closest living relative has a very broad diet, I think it's reasonable to conclude that propleopines were omnivores that included at least some meat in their diets, especially a coltadita and propleopus shiligoensis. And I think the closest analogues in modern day ecosystems would be bears or perhaps more omnivorous members of the dog family. Anyway, you can let me know what you think in the comments section below. So, when we're talking killer kangaroos, I've got to admit they've been the subject of more than a little bit of hype. They certainly weren't giant cat-like carnivores that could rip your head off in a single bite. More your garden variety omnivore, happy to supplement their diets with a small vertebrate prey item when the opportunity arose. I wind it up here. I hope you enjoyed the show, and if you did, please like and subscribe. It'd be much appreciated. I'll be back again next week.